to those of you who are joining us online, we say welcome. We are so glad to have you be a part of worship in that way. And to all of you smiling faces hidden behind masks one more time in the room. Boy, we are so glad to see you here. Welcome to Freedom. And before we are done today, we are going to shuck those masks and be done with them. I was thinking as we were worshiping, loving every bit of it. And part of what I'm loving is knowing we won't be wearing these masks anymore when we gather to do this again next week. Oh, we have much to celebrate today. As Tony said, what a difference a year makes. Last Sunday, uh, last year on Resurrection Sunday, I think there were five of us in the room. So it feels like a party every time we get together now. What a privilege it is to get to worship together and to celebrate Jesus. That's what we want to do today. We just want to lift him high. We want to make much of Jesus and his reputation in this place. Before we turn our attention to the scriptures right now, I want to invite us uh, to pause just for another moment in prayer. Father, we give you praise today for the Lord Jesus and for all that he's done for us. And we pray for a fresh revelation of Jesus in this place. Lord, we invite the work of your Holy Spirit in this time that you would cause the written words of Scripture to come alive and to speak into us and to, to change us by your power. And as we open ourselves up to you today and invite you to do a fresh work in us, we stand against all the works of the kingdom of darkness. And we, in the name of Jesus and with the authority that he gives us, we speak now to any demonic spirit that would seek to... Uh, be present in this room or hold any influence over the lives of the people who are gathered here today or who are watching and listening online. And we bind those spirits in the name of Jesus, commanding you to be silent and to leave us, to leave this place and to go where Jesus instructs, but you are not allowed to return. And we invite and welcome now the Holy Spirit to come and speak in this time. Why don't you just from your own heart just ask God in a fresh way to speak to you today. Why don't you just de declare silently, Jesus, I open myself up to you. I ask you now to do something new in me. Lord, we trust you to do that today. We welcome your work, and we pray this in the wonderful and matchless name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, we want to turn our attention to the scriptures now. And Carl, you did a good job of setting us up today because John 20 is exactly where we are. So thank you for leading into that. John 20, if you've got your Bibles, I'll invite you to go ahead and turn there with me. We'll just immediately turn our attention to the story of the resurrection of Jesus as described by one of Jesus' two closest friends, the Apostle John. John says in verse 20 of, uh, of verse 1 of chapter 20, that early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. That had to be a startling revelation to see the tomb is opened up. That's got to feel a little scary in that moment. So she came running to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, that is John, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. This is like, it feels like terrible insult added on top of injury she's convinced that they've robbed the tomb and what have they now done with jesus body so peter and the other disciples started for the tomb both were running but the other disciple outran peter and reached the tomb first he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there but did not go in and then simon peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb where the strips of linen were lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around jesus head the cloth was still lying there in its place, separate from the linen. And finally, the other disciple, that is John, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. It's a really intriguing thing there because he follows that by saying, they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And the disciples went back to where they were staying. So in this first encounter, they see the empty tomb. And they believe, they believe God is doing something, something good is taking place. They believe in Jesus, but they still can't begin to get their heads around the idea that he may actually be raised from the dead. Verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? Well, they've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. 
At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Why is it, who is it that you're looking for? And thinking that he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'll go get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. At the sound of hearing Jesus speak her name, it suddenly clicked. This is Jesus. And Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord, and she told them that he had said these things to her. But as we're going to see in Mark's account, they didn't believe her. They thought she's out of her mind or she's hallucinating. They didn't think that this had actually happened. It's intriguing to consider that for this one little brief window of time, Mary Magdalene, in the most technical sense, is the only Christian on the planet. She is the only human being who has come to accept that Jesus is the crucified and risen Son of God. And for just a little bit of time, she alone understands he is risen. But she can't get anybody else to accept that he's risen. Verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week, this is what Carl was reading about earlier, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And that is the first thing they needed for Jesus to say because they were scared to death. And when you are already frightened and you're behind locked doors and somebody that you know is dead is suddenly standing there with you, you need some peace, right? So Jesus said, Peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you don't forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, this gathering of the disciples wasn't 12, it was 10. You remember Judas, he's gone out and killed himself for betraying Jesus. But one of the remaining 11 was missing. Verse 24, Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And this is the way things stood for a week's time. Ten have seen him. Thomas is not. So for a week, Thomas thinks, they're nuts. I'm not going to believe. But a week later, his disciples were in the house again. And Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Apparently, the resurrected Jesus, which is a, his body is a prototype of what we're going to be like in the resurrection. It's a physical body, and yet it is no longer bound by the laws of nature as we know them. He's able to be off the ground. He's able to move through closed doors. That's pretty cool to consider. Suddenly Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen, yet they have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. It's a wonderful picture of the events not only of Resurrection Sunday, but of what it transpired a week later. We're in a series, we're deep into a series right now that's entitled Choices That Define Us. If you've got your outlines, I'll invite you to pull them out and follow along. And we've been talking about a lot of the choices that we have to make in life that go so far in determining both individually and as a family of faith who we are and how we're going to live our lives. Every one of the things that we've talked about 
are vitally important, but they all pale in comparison to what we're going to talk about today. The choice today, we want to talk about a choice that defines us. The choice that we talk about today will define you for the rest of your life and for all of eternity. This choice today is choosing faith over sight. Choosing to live a life by what you believe instead of just living by what you can see. And the account that we've read today is a beautiful picture of how we wrestle with this. Now, this is such a, a major issue. And I, what I want to do in the next few minutes is just simply share four very straightforward thoughts. This is not going to be easy, uh, difficult for anybody to, to follow or understand. It's, it's very straightforward. But I want you to track along with me as we consider the choice that we have to make between whether we're going to be people who really orient our lives around what we believe and live based on what we believe or whether we're just going to live based completely, solely on what we can see and prove and know for a fact. So four thoughts to consider this morning. The first is this, that a sight mindset, just to be clear on what we're contrasting here, that a sight mindset is one that always says, I will only believe what I can see and prove. Wouldn't you agree that the world that we live in today increasingly operates from that perspective? And that's not a criticism, it's just an observation. We, we live in, in an increasingly intellectual culture. I know if you watch us on the news, we may feel like that's not the case, but, but we are. We, we are an increasingly informed culture, and we tend to operate based on intellect, and science is very much a driving force in terms of what we believe. And so thinking that we're operating in a very informed and intellectual way, we tend to, to gear our minds completely around just scientific facts, and that becomes for us the bottom line. Well, let me say, first of all, that I love science. I am very much a student of science, and I'm crazy about science. The irony of the day is that in our lifetimes... Science is rapidly ceasing to be science and is behaving more like religion than like science because science is all about what can be seen, tested, truly observed, and proven. That's what science does. Science is about observation. But now science has turned into this thing where we take what used to be clearly theories, and we were careful to say these are just theories and ideas about what might be because we aren't able to observe these things, so all we can do is theorize about them. And now we've moved them forward to where we have all of these things that cannot be proven that we're told that we should accept as fact. And I'm not going to chase this rabbit far. I'm just, just making a point. I mean, you realize now in the name of science, you're supposed to believe in macroevolution. You're supposed to believe that everything exists just evolved over billions of years into what we have now because it's a scientific fact, except it's not. It's not. We've never anywhere in the world observed macroevolution ever happening. It's never been seen. But it's a scientific fact now. There used to be the theory of the Big Bang. It's no longer a theory. Now it's scientific fact, although science has never been around to observe that or prove it. But we, so science has become more of a matter of faith, but we're told these are facts. Well, here's the, the truth of the matter. When it's all said and done, there are going to be a lot of things in life you're not going to be able to prove. You're going to have to choose what you believe. M many of us choose mindsets that are all about, well, I'm only going to believe what science has proven or what I can see with my eyes. A sight mindset has that kind of perspective. And we see it demonstrated again and again in the John 20 account. Mary saw and believed. That's exactly what she's declaring. In, in verse 18, Mary Magdalene comes and says, I have seen the Lord, thus I believe. The disciples hear it, and their response is, well, we haven't seen him, so we don't believe. But when they have seen him, they report to Thomas. Let us tell you what we have seen. And so in verse uh, 25, that's what they declare. We have seen the Lord. And Thomas's response, unless I see, I will not believe. The point here is all of us by nature, we start out thinking that way. We start out thinking, I'm only going to believe what I can see. Well, that becomes a major stumbling block for faith, doesn't it? Because Faith is all about trusting in a God that you cannot see with your eyes, at least not 
at this point in, in our experience. It brings us to the second thought for the day. And that is that we need to understand that questions and doubts are very normal for a person of faith, and these are very different from a refusal to believe. Now let's unpack that thought for just a moment. Everybody who grew up in church knows about Thomas. But we didn't just call him Thomas growing up in church, did we? What did we all call him? Of course, everybody knows. He's doubting Thomas. It's always such a shame when somebody gets a terrible nickname that they don't deserve, and Thomas certainly got it. I mean, he looks like the biggest slacker of all the disciples, doesn't he? You won't even believe. A week after Jesus has risen, no matter how many people tell you, you just won't believe. You big doubter. Don't you know Jesus is so disappointed in you? The truth of the matter is, none of the disciples believed without seeing him. Thomas just didn't have the advantage of being there on Resurrection Sunday night to see. But Thomas is actually a very faithful disciple. If you were to rewind just a little bit to John 11 which was the most recent visit that the disciples have made to the Jerusalem area. The other disciples did not want to go. This is when Lazarus was sick, and he's actually just died. And they've just gotten the news, and so they need to go back to Jerusalem. Well, the disciples all know there is bloodshed coming in Jerusalem. There is going to be a showdown, and they're scared to death to go to Jerusalem. And they're wanting to just back out and tell Jesus that they're not going to go. And when they're on the verge of that, Thomas is the only one who steps up and says... I'm going, and we might as well all go and die with him. That doesn't sound like the biggest slacker in the group, the biggest doubter. He just didn't happen to be there on that first Sunday night to see Jesus. He was a doubter, just like the other disciples were doubters. He was a little slower to believe. But here's what I want you to take note of in that. Jesus didn't reject him because of that. Jesus didn't despise him because of that. Jesus did for him the same thing that he did for Mary and for the disciples on the road to Emmaus and for the ten who were gathered that night. He made himself known in a personal way. And as a result, Thomas came to faith. And the thing that I want you to understand that to me is just so important that we we can't afford to go through life failing to recognize is that for people of faith, questions and even doubts are a very normal part of life. I remember all too vividly what life was like for me as a teenager. As those of you from around here know, I've been in church all my life, always have been in church. And I came to faith in Christ as a child. It was a very normal thing for me as a young kid to come to faith. But when I was an adolescent and I was developing from the faith of a child to what would become the faith of an adult, the faith of a child so easily accepts what everybody that I respect loves Jesus and trusts Jesus and trusts the authority of the Bible and the reality of God. So I naturally inherited that kind of faith. But eventually that kind of faith has to develop into an adult faith where I don't just believe it because everybody that I respect believes it. It has to be mine. And I want to tell you, those years in between when I was an adolescent, I questioned and doubted everything. I was doing it silently. I was scared to death to say out loud what I was really thinking and feeling because everybody around me had such a deep faith. And I'm thinking, they're going to hate me for this. They're going to feel like I'm just some kind of terrible apostate, that I'm going to hell. And I thought half the time I was going to hell. And in my head, I would just go round and round in all these circles asking the questions of, how do I know God is really real? What if I just believe this because my parents believed it? How do I know that this book is really true? How can I ever know? I mean, what if I only believe the things that I believe because I was born in America and I was brought up in a Christian culture? How do I know Jesus even ever existed? How do I know he went to the cross or that he rose from the dead? How can I ever know these things for a fact? And oh my goodness. If I'm questioning the existence of God, that means I can't be a Christian. That means God's going to send me to hell. Now, you've got to admit, that's a pretty wacky cycle of things. I'm not sure there's a God. But now that I question that there's a God, that God's going to send me to hell because I question that he's God. Okay, I'm tired just telling you that. The reality is some of you have done that same set of gyrations in your own mind. What I want to tell you today is relax. It is a very normal part of the Christian experience to ask questions and to have moments when you doubt. 
Doubt is very different from disbelief. It's very different from skepticism. I have a, a great deal of respect for Christians who are honest enough to say, there are moments when I consider the greatness of a God who made everything, who holds everything in existence, who is in contact with everyone, who is watching over everyone at the same time, we cannot see him, and yet he is that wise, he is that powerful, he is that all-present. There are moments where that just like shorts my brain out, and I just have a hard time believing that there can be a being so great. You know what? I have great respect for people who can own that. There are moments where in a moment of time, that fries my brain, and I'm like, can this be for real? I mean, have we just believed something? I mean, if we had sold a bill of goods because that seems too good to be true. Now, because of all that I've experienced, it only takes about that long to snap into reality and go, but he is real. It is true. I know him. I've experienced him. But I want to tell you that getting to that place, for most of us, it involves asking a lot of questions and having moments where we're like, but can I be sure? How can I know when I've never seen him? It's okay. It's normal for us to have to deal with those kinds of things. Mark's account of that Resurrection Sunday says in verses 9 and following that after Jesus rose from the dead early on Sunday morning, the first person who saw him was Mary Magdalene, the woman from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went to the disciples who were grieving and weeping and told them what had happened. But when she told them what, that Jesus was alive and that she had seen them, they didn't believe her. And afterwards, he appeared in a different form to two of his followers who were walking from Jerusalem into the country. And this is what Luke gives an account of. He tells us in detail about these two on the road to Emmaus. And so after they realized who Jesus was, they rushed back to tell the others, but no one believed them. Now think about this. These are the people to whom Jesus is entrusting the keys to the kingdom. I mean, have you ever just stopped to think about how much the future of humanity rests on the shoulders of the disciples. I mean, if this little bitty group screws it up, the world is lost. Jesus is trusting everything to them, and initially they're filled with doubts, questions, and, and they just can't believe. None of them can believe it. But God doesn't reject them for that. Why? Why? Because God isn't giving us a one-moment-in-time litmus test to decide whether he wants to accept us or reject us based on whether we believe in one moment. God is in the process of calling each one of us over time to know him, to trust him, to belong to him and his family. And that's wonderful news for us. Because for most of us, it is a process, and it doesn't look the same for all of us. Mary saw him in the garden. She had a particular kind of encounter, and she just knew and believed, and it settled it right then and there. But for the, uh, the next ten, it was in a different moment and a different way. For the two on the road to Emmaus, it was a different experience. For Thomas, it was at a different time and a different experience. But the bottom line is, in his own way, Jesus personally spoke and appeared in the lives of of these people building faith in them. I find this really comforting to know that he isn't put off by our questions and doubts. He understands that questions and doubts are actually faith seeds that have not yet fully developed into what they're going to be. I find it encouraging that Jude tells us in Jude 22, show mercy toward those who have doubts. Question next. Questions and doubts are a part of the process. The third truth I want you to consider this morning is that the best things in life usually cannot be measured or proven. They just must be experienced. Everybody in John 20, they got to see Jesus. They were invited to, to touch the nail prints, to touch the gaping wound in Jesus' side. And for years I would read this and think, it's just not fair. I mean, when I was a teenager wrestling with all of this, it's like, it's not fair. They had the same doubts that I've got, but he showed up in the flesh, 
and said, check it out. And I, I used to think as I wrestled with doubts, it's like, well, why don't you do it for me? Why don't you do some big magic trick for me? And I would ask him to do like crazy stuff to prove his existence. He would never do it. Never would do it. And that would leave me even more afraid and frustrated because of that. And I'm like, it just doesn't seem fair. Why would you do it for them? I'll tell you part of the reason that he did show up in the flesh for them. They have that advantage, but they also had one gigantic disadvantage that you and I don't have. We know Jesus was crucified, but we didn't have to see it. They did. And it is one thing to just know in your head that Jesus was crucified. It is another to have watched them mutilate Jesus. The things that they did to him. They ripped his back to shreds. By the time they were done, the cat of nine tails was likely digging into vital organs before they would pull it down and rip it out. He was bleeding to death before they ever nailed him to the cross. And when he had hung there, bleeding out for six hours, when that Roman soldier came up with a spear and rammed it up into his side, it didn't just pierce his flesh. It ran through the vital organs until it penetrated the sack around his heart, just ripping to shreds all of the vital organs. They watched all of this. They saw him as dead as a human can be, and they were convinced of all the things that could happen. That man can never live again. So they needed to see him alive. I'm curious, how many of you have ever watched The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ? Most of us have. All right, I've seen your hands. How many of you have watched it every year again at this time of year since it came out? Nobody in the room raised their hands, including the preacher. Why? It's too painful. I've seen it twice, and I felt like I was going to die both times. It's so moving, but it is so painful and it's a somewhat watered down version of what jesus really went through it's so hard for us to to even see that they were there for hours taking that in firsthand they needed to see jesus alive again we don't get that i'm sorry if you're struggling with doubts and questions if you're struggling with coming to faith jesus is not going to show up with picture id and say, it's me. Here's my driver's license. Here's the nail prints. Here's the wound in the side. He's not going to do that for you. It's why he spoke the blessing that he did at the end of, of this chapter. He said, you believe because you've seen me. Great blessings belong to people who believe without seeing me. And because we don't get to see him in the flesh in this life, there are a lot of people who just say, well, I'm never going to believe in a God that I can't see doesn't make sense. I can't do that. I'm just not that kind of faith person. I would contend to you today, in life, period, the very best things that you can ever experience, the vast majority of them, you have to take by faith and just experience them. You can't measure it, you can't test it, and you can't prove it. I mean, think about the, the best things in life. I mean, one of the best things in life has to be the experience of being in love, doesn't it? Anybody been in love before? Come on now, that wasn't a rhetorical question. Anybody been in love? Somebody say, yeah, I am in love. I'm in love with that woman in the pink dress. I am smitten with her. It gets better with time. I'm not lying. I am in love. But you know what? I can't measure it, I can't test it, and I can't even prove it. I think she loves me. I know she likes me a lot. <laughs> she puts up with me. I actually believe that she loves me, but I can't measure it. I've never been able to really test it. Don't know how to put it on a scale, but I've experienced it. It is good. It is And it's sort of sad to me that occasionally you come across somebody that will say, I, I've never been in love. I, I've just never experienced it. And I'll hear some people who are really cynical about love, and they're like, I, I think it's a fairy tale. I don't think that kind of love really exists. Well, I can't prove it to you. I can't. I've lived it. All I know is you have to experience it to know how good it is. To be in a relationship where there is a person that they are basically the first thing that you think about when you wake up in the morning. 
They are the thing that all day long you're looking forward to. All day long you're looking forward to the end of the day because you get to be together. All week long you're just looking forward to the weekend because you get extended time with them. They are the person that you're going to lay down next to at night when you go to bed. I want to tell you, that is a fantastic feeling. But you can't prove it. You just have to accept it and experience it. A lot of things that are good are that way. I love how Psalm 34, 8 describes it. It says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. You ever just think about how the very best foods that you've ever had, you can't prove that they're good. You just have to experience them. I mean, like, how do you measure the goodness of food? On a scale of 1 to 100, it's 99 yummies. I mean, what, what, what's the scale that measures how good something is? And sometimes it doesn't look good. I will never forget the first time in my life that I ever experienced soft-shell crab. I didn't know what I was getting into. I mean, when they brought that out on a plate, I, not only had I not eaten it, I realized in that moment I have never seen it. <laughs> Seriously. It's like somebody has put a tarantula on steroids, then they battered it and deep fried it and put it on a plate next to its twin and served it for my dinner. And the scary thing is some nice people had taken us out to dinner and bought that for my dinner. So I'm like, I can't just throw it away. I've got to eat this tarantula. It looks terrible. Has everybody experienced soft shell crab? You know what I'm talking about? Oh, my goodness. How do you shell this thing? Oh, you eat that. How do you get all the bad stuff out of it? You just eat that too. What? And so I'm like between a rock and a hard place. Give me something to dip it in. I tried it, and all of a sudden I go from thinking, you're feeding me a tarantula to going, where has this been all my life? This is really good. I suddenly have a new addition to my list of favorite foods. I love soft-shell crab. It's fantastic. But you just have to taste and see. Sometimes it's not enough for somebody else to tell you or to try to show you. You just have to step across the line and say, I'm going to find out for myself if this is really the real deal. The best things in life tend to be that way. Good food, true love, you can't prove it. Well, faith and a relationship with God, it really can't be tested, measured, or proven. It just has to be experienced. And it, that brings us to the last thing that I want to share with you today. Faith, Christian faith, is not the suspension of reason, but it is acting on what we believe is true. It's easy to think that Christian faith, belief in a God that you can't see, would just require you to dumb yourself down and just turn off your brain and take this blind leap into the darkness. And I want to tell you, that's not what Christian faith really is. John makes the point, he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, and we didn't even write those things down. In fact, he said, you would fill so many books trying to record all of the amazing things that Jesus did. Those are not recorded in this book, but these are written down that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. What's the point that he's making here? He's saying you're being invited to take a step of faith. And it is indeed faith, but it's not blind faith. It's interesting to me that of all the words in the English language that have a variety of definitions, faith has about the widest range of definitions of any words in the language. It's part of the reason we get confused. One of the definitions of the English word faith is literally a blind leap into the dark. That is not what we're talking about. I think a blind leap into the dark is foolish. I'm not going to take that. Christian faith is not that. Christian faith is personal trust in the personal God who has revealed himself in the person of Jesus. And that's a very different thing. And the scriptures give us a very detailed description of the person of Jesus. John said, we wrote these things down so that you would really know who he is and what he's like. Now, I told you earlier, in my own experience, I wrestled with all of it. 
Is God real? How do I know that he's real? What if the Bible's not true? Is the Bible really true? And so I'll tell you what I did in my own experience. I silently set out on my own quest to find out. I didn't become a skeptic. I didn't become someone who refuses to believe. I just decided I'm going to look into this and try and find out for myself. And you need not be afraid of doing that. I think sometimes Christians are afraid, like, ooh, if I were to really look into it, what if I found out the Bible isn't true? What if I found out there's all these holes? And I want to tell you, you don't have to be afraid in the least. And you don't have to take my word for these things, but I'll give you a two-minute summary of what I found. Years of looking into it, I'm talking about from more of, of the factual and academic side of things. Here's a couple of things that I discovered. Number one, that there is no other book like this book in all of, of world literature. Nothing even comes close. It's not one book. It's 66 books written by 40 authors over 1,500 years of time in three different languages on three different continents. And yet, over that great span of time and diversity of authors and cultures, it has an incredible continuity and unity that it reveals one God and one message from end to end. That's so impossible. But I want to tell you also from a text-critical analysis standpoint. In other words, when you look at this book as far as how it stands up in terms of its accuracy compared to any other book from ancient times, nothing comes close. It is so consistently recorded. The thousands and thousands of texts that we have dating back so close to the point in time when it was originally written. And I mean, the next closest thing is off by hundreds of years, and there are literally like 70 pieces of ancient text pointing back to the other ancient books. We have thousands that go back almost to the moment that it was written. It is so incredibly consistent and accurate, but far more importantly beyond that is this book is ultimately all about one person, and that is Jesus. And when you really begin to, to root around and dig into the question of, did Jesus really live? Is he really who this book reveals? What you will find historically is that there is no one else who has lived in ancient times whose life is, mo is more thoroughly or carefully chronicled than Jesus of Nazareth. We know with certainty that 2,000 years ago there was a Jewish rabbi named Jesus from the mountain village of Nazareth who lived and ministered in Palestine during this period in history. We know with certainty that he was executed at the hands of the Romans. And here's the kicker. There's nothing else that's happened in ancient times about which there is more clarity than the fact that this rabbi was raised from the dead. Now today I don't have time to do it, but I want to tell you the, the evidence is compelling. If you want to scratch around a, a little bit about this, it's easy to go online and find great articles that will give you the overwhelming evidence that Jesus was who the Bible says, that he did what it says, that he died, and that he rose from the dead. If you really want to dive into it, there's a couple of books out there that, are, that will help you with this. Josh McDowell's old book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He was one of these guys that was out to disprove Jesus and disprove Christianity, and he became a Christian as a result. Because the evidence was overwhelming. Uh, more recently, Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ, he's a writer for the Chicago Tribune, and he's doing this in-depth series of articles on world religions, and along the way, he's kind of blowing up, you know, what's wrong with each faith, and he, he did not like Christianity, and he really wanted to disprove Christianity, and when he got to Christianity, he realized it just was unlike every other faith, and what he discovered was, oh my goodness, these things really happened. And then it became real in his life, and he became a follower of Jesus. My point is very simply this. Christianity is not some crazy religion that forces you to sort of go la, 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 la to everything that's supposed to be true and real and pretend like there's something real that is not. No, Christianity is rooted in the truth. Christianity is rooted in what has actually happened. It's not a blind leap into the dark. The scriptures are true. Jesus is the real deal. Hebrews 11 spells out what the core of Christianity is all about. It says this, faith. Faith means being sure of the things that we hope for and knowing that something is real even if we do not see it. Without faith, no one can please God. 
Anyone who comes to God must believe that he's real and that he rewards those who truly want to find him. My favorite question to, to ask people to engage them in meaningful conversation is to just ask the basic question, in your opinion, what do you understand that it takes for a person to go to heaven? You learn so much about a person when you ask them that question. Wouldn't you agree that that's a good question to, to have to think about and wrestle with? What does it take for a person to go to heaven? It's so intriguing to hear the answers that you get. And I'm just going to cut to the chase and tell you, by far, the most common answer that you'll get to that is well, you got to be a good person. you got to try hard. you you got to love others. you got to do more good than bad so that when it's all weighed out, the, the good outweighs the bad in your life. It's all of this stuff. And whenever people have shared their whole deal, I'll always come back and say, thank you so much for sharing that. I love hearing what people think about that. Would you be interested to know how the Bible answers that? And it's always fun to watch their faces when they hear that, like, what? <laughs> you mean that isn't the Bible's answer to that question? No, it's not, but you just shared the most common answer to that question. Would you like to know how the Bible answers it? Well, yeah, I'd like to know how the Bible answers it. The Bible answers it with one word. What does it take for a person to go to heaven? It takes faith. And just for clarity's sake, the Bible word for faith in the New Testament, which is written in Greek, that Bible word pistis, if it's, a, if it's a noun, it gets translated as faith. If it's a verb, it gets translated as believe or trust. So just know when you see any of those three words, it's basically it's the same word. Believe, trust, have faith. Hebrews says that Christian faith is being sure of what you hope for and certain of what you cannot see. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So how, how do we step into this faith? How do we act on this faith? Because if you actually read that Hebrews 11.1 1 that I just quoted, if you read it in the Greek, what it says is that faith is the substantiating of what is hoped for. I love that. That's a great word. I want you to chew on this for a moment. Faith is not just, well, I hope there's a God. I hope Jesus is for real. I hope he rose from the dead. I hope he comes back. I hope he forgives my sins. I mean, it's one thing to have hope, but it is a different deal to substantiate that hope. What is that? That's not a word we throw around. Use. What does it mean to substantiate something? Oh, it means I'm not just going to sit here and wring my hands and say, well, I hope, maybe. No, I am going to act in a way that it actually gives form to this. It crystallizes something here. What does that mean and what does that look like? I'll give you a simple analogy that I think lines up pretty well. I said what I did about the love relationship that Jackie and I have. Here's the thing that to me is interesting to consider. We've been married for several years now, but I loved her before I married her. I was convinced that she loved me. I don't know that she was convinced that she loved me. She had to think about that a little bit. But she, she got convinced enough that she loved me that we got married. Some of you are laughing because you know us well enough. You know how true that story is. It took a little convincing, but she, she got convinced that she loved me back before we were married. Now, I believed that we could love each other for the rest of our lives. I believed that we could have this very personal, exclusive relationship for the rest of our lives. But it didn't matter until November the 1st of 2014 when underneath an oak tree next to the water at the Grand Hotel, we stood in front of both of our families before a pastor and before God and we made a solemn commitment and vow to each other to forsake all others, to love, honor, and cherish each other until the day that we die. It didn't matter how much we loved each other prior to that moment, we still did not have a marriage. We loved one another. We had deep feelings for each other, but we were not married until there was a moment in time that we drew a line. We drove a stake, and we said, you know what? All the world can watch and pay attention. We are declaring in the sight of God, you alone, you and me, forevermore. To get out of it, somebody got to die because we are in for life. We felt this before today, but we were not married before today because to be married, you have to say, I'm in. I'm declaring, 
I'm in. That is what Christian faith looks like. It is not enough to just believe that there is a God, that he is a good God, that he's a loving God, that he has a son named Jesus who died on the cross and rose from the dead. It is not enough to just believe that that is the case. There has to be a moment in time when you draw a line and say, I'm in. I'm putting my faith in that. That's what John declares at the beginning of the story when he says, Yet to all who did receive him, Jesus, to all who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. This is the beautiful thing. You know who gets to go to heaven? You know who gets to go to heaven in the world? Of all the people in the world, who gets to go to heaven? The family of God. That's what God's always been doing. He's been assembling a family. He's been forming a family for himself. And the only people who go to heaven are the family of God. And John said, here's how you get in the family. Two words sum the whole thing up. Believe and receive. That's what you got to do. You want to know what it takes to be a Christian? You got to believe and receive. What is it you have to believe? You got to believe what we've been talking about. You have to believe that there is a God. That's what Hebrews 11 said. You got to believe that God exists and that He rewards those who trust Him. You have to believe in God. You have to believe the message of Jesus, the sinless Son of God, who died on the cross for your sins and rose from the dead, that that paid the price for your sins so that you can belong to the family of God. You must believe that just like before we got married. I believe that Jackie loved me, wanted to be with me forever. I believe that I felt the same way for her. We still aren't married yet. Why? Because there is a moment that we must receive. I believed it, but I had to receive her as my wife. I had to receive her ring for me. I had to receive her commitment to me. I had to make a commitment to her. And in that moment of time, not only something legal, but something mystical was created. There was a mystical God-ordained union that happened, and it only happened because we made a commitment and received each other's love and vow. To become a person of faith, you have to believe some things but you have to receive. What is it you have to receive? You have to receive the love and forgiveness of God. You have to receive the fact that you are forgiven and accepted as a child of God. And you have to receive the person of Jesus as the Lord and King and pilot of your life. It's that simple. You don't need a class for this. In fact, Jesus said, you really can't even do this unless you just become like a little child, that you just accept it by faith. Kids can accept things simply from their parents. And it's what you do. do. Do I believe the message about Jesus? Yeah. Do I have moments where I have questions about it? Yeah, but I still believe it. Will you receive his forgiveness? Will you receive his love? Will you receive him into your life so that he can be the one to guide you, to shape you, to change you into a new and better person? This is what it means to live as a person of faith. We have to choose. Am I going to live based only on what I see? If that's the case, I'll miss the best things in life. I'll miss soft shell crabs and a loving marriage, and I'll miss living in a personal relationship with the God who made me. The question today is such a simple one. Has this happened in your life? Those of you watching and listening online, has this happened in your life? Have you believed the message about Jesus? It doesn't mean that you don't have any doubts. It doesn't mean you don't have any questions. But do you choose to believe the message of Jesus? Okay. If so, you're about three-quarters of the way there. Have you received? Has there been a moment in time when you've said... I need your forgiveness, Jesus. I need your love. I need you in my life, and I'm asking you to come in to forgive me and to save me and to do something new in me, make a new, better person out of me. Because the moment that we do that, the rest of your life is changed. You no longer just have your willpower. You have the power of God working in you, changing you, and nobody gets to take that away. It is a beautiful thing when that happens, isn't it? I want to invite you to bow with me as we turn to the Lord together in prayer. Father, we are so grateful for the gift of Jesus and what he does in our lives and the change that he brings about in us. We pray today.
for gifts of clarity and faith here in our, in our hearts and minds. I want to ask you with your heads bowed and eyes closed, and I really don't want anybody looking around. I want this just to be a private moment where you just get to be still in the presence of God. If you know that in your own life that what we've talked about today has already happened, you have believed and you have received, and you, you know, hey, I, yes, I am right with God. I didn't do anything to earn it, but yes, I am I am a Christian. I am a person of faith right with God. Would you just indicate that by raising your hand just as a silent testimony? Yes, I belong to him. Awesome. That is so cool. Thank you. You can put your hands down. If you just raised your hand, why don't you just take a moment to just say thank you, God. Thank you again for Jesus. Thank you for new life. Thank you for your forgiveness. And then I want to invite you, if you raised your hand, just take a moment to pray for other people seated around you, people watching online that didn't raise their hands or were honest and said, that hasn't happened for me yet. I want, to, I want to say a word to those of you who didn't raise your hands. First of all, thanks for being honest about that. Nobody here was just born in the family of God. That's why Jesus said, you all must be born again. If the things that we've talked about haven't happened today, my question to you is a very simple one. Is there anything that would prevent you from today making the most important decision of your life to choose to believe in Jesus and to receive his love and forgiveness in your life. Friends, the fact that you're watching and listening at home, don't let that be a deterrent for you. God is present with you right now. Just as Thomas, he had to wait until the time was right for him. For some of you, today is the day that is that right moment. You don't need to wait for another day. God brought you here today to hear the gospel message. Would you today choose to trust and follow Jesus? If, if you want to do that, I want to just invite you as we're bowed together. I want you to just pray a simple prayer with me. If you want to open your life up to receive Christ and place your faith in him, would you just, you don't even have to say the words out loud. You can just pray it in your heart. Lord Jesus. I believe in you. I believe you died for me. I believe you paid for my sins. I believe you came back from the dead. Would you come into my life? Would you forgive my sins? Wipe the slate clean? And give me a fresh start? Would you make a new and better person out of me? The best way I know how, I give you control of my life. Thanks for hearing my prayer and for saving me. Now, I still don't want anybody looking around. I just want to ask you, if you did that, all I want to do, I'm not going to single you out. I, I just want to be able to pray over you. But if you just prayed that prayer with me, and would you just, just lift your hand for just a moment? Just say, yes, yes, thank you. Who else? Any, anybody else? Just, just today, just prayed to receive the forgiveness of God. Anybody else? Thank you, yes. Anyone else? Anybody else? We won't stretch this out. Anybody else that said, yep? Yes, thank you. Anybody else? Hey, if you're watching and listening online, I want you to just, just message us and let us know that. We want to be able to pray for you and encourage you. Father, I thank you for these who today have opened themselves up to your love and forgiveness, and I pray that you would seal this moment the, with the sweet deposit of your Holy Spirit. Give them today the joy of knowing that they are accepted, loved, and forgiven. I pray that you'd encourage them and use them powerfully. We give you thanks for the work that you're doing in us. And we pray this in Jesus' matchless name and all of God's people said, Amen and Amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today. I surely hope that what you heard was relevant and helpful and above everything. I hope that what you experienced today really helped your heart to connect with the heart of God. Now, if what you heard uh, for you stirred up any questions or maybe led you toward uh, some type of spiritual decision, maybe you want to talk with someone about something that's on your mind, I would love to hear from you. And so I would encourage you, reach out by email. At the bottom of the screen, you see my email address. It's mark at myfreedomchurch.net. That's not going to go to a secretary or an assistant. That will come directly to me. I'd love to hear from you and talk with you about anything that's on your mind. 
And if in the future you're in our area, we would love for you to come and worship with us at Freedom Church. But until then, we invite you to access all of the sermon material that you find online. Again, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Hope that you have a great day.